good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'll try to be brief, too. Uh, what can we say about these off-year earnings? I would say solid earnings, disciplined management action, uh, actions, strong balance sheet. Uh, you will see that revenues are modestly up, but that this is reflecting very uh, uh, different evolutions, reflecting management actions. Earnings, underlying earnings are stable. Adjusted earnings are up nearly 30%. Net income is down when compared with the first half last, first half last year. But after the uh, 1.5 billion impact of the uh, UK transaction, um, if you take that out, uh, it would have been up very, very significantly. As far as the balance sheet is concerned, the solvency is a strong one and is back to the levels we had before the crisis. So if I go into slightly more details before Denis goes into much more details, why did I say disciplined growth? Well, the fact that the revenues are going by approximately 1% doesn't mean that it's going by approximately 1% every, everywhere. Uh, it's a contrasted picture. They are up 1.5% in life. The margins are up two points. And uh, uh, when you look at the uh, next slide, you will see that they are decreasing in the US and in France increasing strongly in Southeast Asia and in some countries like Italy because of the bank assurance agreement we have. This does not mean that we are unsuccessful in the U.S. The new, re, uh, the new um, uh, variable annuity product retirement cornerstone is developing well, but by comparison with last year, it's lower. In France, the revenues are lower because the growth is more disciplined. We do not underwrite large contracts which have too low uh, margins. If you look at PNC, revenues are up 0.4%. The, there, too, there is a contrast between the retail lines, where the revenues are up 4%, and the commercial lines, where the revenues are down because we are more selective. More interestingly, uh, it's a disciplined growth because we've been doing what we told you we would do. The current year combined ratio is improving by 1.5 points, despite a significant level of natural events. This is a reflection of the uh, pricing actions we've been uh, uh, taking in the, uh, in the different markets. So this slide is very much reflecting what I said on personal lines versus uh, uh, commercial lines and on uh, um, uh, U.S. French life market versus the, uh, the Asian markets. So this, I would say, limited growth for the revenues uh, uh, is the reflection of, of uh, uh, very uh, strong management actions to look for growth in the areas where you have significant margins and be more disciplined in other places. The earnings, underlying earnings are pretty stable. Adjusted earnings are up 30% because we have less impairments. You will see that later and we are coming back to more uh, normalized levels in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of capital gains. Net income, I've already mentioned that. It's down when compared with the first half last year, but it's down because of the 1.5 uh, hit we have taken uh, due to the uh, UK transaction, which is a good transaction because it's creating flexibility for us and it's enabling us to leave a segment of the market which we were seeing as non-strategic to reposition ourselves uh, um, in something which we see as having good growth prospects. It means that the group is having an active capital management, which is, I think, what we need to have in this environment. When the multiples are low, the multiples at which you are traded are low, the best way to grow the group is, of course, to try to do as much as you can organically, but it's also to redeploy capital, to redeploy existing capital, taking it out from the places where the uh, profitability is subpar, to realign, reposition it in places where you have more growth and more margins. This is what we are doing. Um, of course, this does not mean that we have been leaving the UK market on the contrary. I think that thanks to the work which has been done in the past years, we are now very well positioned on the, wealth management, uh, on the wealth management side. Balance sheet, solvency is up to uh, pre-crisis level if you measure it with, uh, with solvency one. If you look at the debt gearing, 
it's up when compared to the first half last year, but largely because of foreign exchange impacts, and the 29% is before the impact of the UK transaction. Uh, Denis will come back uh, to the uh, detail of the numbers, but it's a level we are, we are comfortable with. So uh, this is where we are in a nutshell. I will leave Denis now uh, going to the detail of the, uh, of the numbers. Thank you, Henri. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I will uh, uh, share this presentation with uh, Gérald Darlin uh, and first uh, start with the uh, th first theme that Henri articulated on discipline growth. Uh, as you uh, must have seen, our growth has been modest in the, in the uh, first half. Uh, asset management uh, grew by 10% because of the uh, uh, recovery in the uh, markets plus the dollar effect, uh, but for the rest, our um, um, revenues were flat on a uh, comparable basis and up 3% on a reported basis. When you look at the uh, life and savings side, uh, you see that uh, our AP was also uh, uh, just up 1%, NBV up 21% with a margin which uh, uh, reached 19.1%. Uh, and again, this is a contracted picture with uh, U.S. down, but uh, sequentially up quarter on quarter by about uh, uh, 10%. Uh, we see, uh, and I, I will comment further on the, on the U.S., France down uh, for, the, for reasons I will uh, elaborate uh, upon a bit, a bit later. And also Japan, which is here mixed in the uh, Asia-Pacific number. Uh, Japan down because of a, uh, the withdrawal of a... Uh, uh, cancer uh, product which was coming from Vitatour and was not uh, profitable. Uh, we see uh, quite strong growth in the uh, Mediterranean Latin American region, uh, essentially because of the growth uh, of the uh, AXA MPS uh, JV, which was uh, up 64% in, uh, in uh, APE terms. And we also had high growth in uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Hong Kong, and uh, Central and Eastern Europe. The, uh, uh, we'd like to uh, go a little bit deeper into our life and savings business, and we will uh, spend more time on that uh, at our uh, autumn seminar, hopefully. When you look at the APE, you see that APE is made of uh, investment and savings for 55%. When you look at the NBV, NBV uh, is dominated by protection and health. Protection and health represent 68% of our new business value, and this is reflected in the uh, uh, at the bottom of the slide with the uh, NBV margins, which uh, is uh, around 40% for protection and health versus 10% for uh, investment and savings. So uh, clearly uh, we uh, have uh, strong profitability in protection and health and much lower profitability in investment and savings, which is not a surprise in a low interest rate environment, but also a topic that we must uh, address uh, going forward. Going back to the U.S., uh, you see that uh, we've had uh, a quarter or qu on, qu or on quarter since Q3 2009 a 9% uh, compound uh, growth. Uh, we uh, believe that our, that our market share is slightly up in Q2. Uh, and uh, more importantly, uh, the product that we launched in January in our proprietary networks and uh, March, April in our third-party networks, the Retirement Cornerstone, which is a product which is uh, higher in terms of uh, new business value margin and lower in terms of capital intensity, is, uh, is progressing. Retirement Cornerstone represented 16% of our uh, first-year premiums in Q1 and 42% uh, uh, of our first-year uh, premiums in, uh, in Q2. We launched another... Uh, uh, an annuity product protected capital strategies in uh, we are launching in the second half of this year which will uh, also be a higher margin lower capital consumption product so we are continuing to uh, innovate on the product front uh, to protect our margins and uh, uh, hopefully uh, stabilize or slightly improve our market share in france uh, which is also uh, uh, a country where our margins on life, uh, on, especially on the saving side, uh, are low. Uh, we have uh, decided to uh, stop competing in the uh, low margin family office business uh, where we have uh, high guaranteed rates. Uh, the uh, 
regulation will be helping us uh, later this year as at, at the start of this month we have a maximum uh, in the regulation maximum uh, uh, interest rate guarantees for the first two years of the um, uh, contracts uh, but the uh, if you take out those uh, large premium uh, individual uh, life business uh, um, we see a progression and we also see a progression of the proportion of unit link business which you can see on the right side of the slide we have 16 percent of uh, unit linked in our business versus 13 percent for the market uh, at the end of q2 uh, and this translates into a 12 percent new business value margin for individual lines in france again focus on profitability rather than uh, volumes pnc uh, same story uh, we uh, had to increase uh, our prices and be more selective in terms of uh, our renewals uh, in the um, in pnc on personal lines uh, we have been successful in uh, translating those price increases into volume increases because we are relying more on our proprietary networks and the strengths of our brands and all in all uh, you, you see that we've been able to have 3.6 percent volume growth on the back of 3% price increase and uh, this is uh, also uh, more than 700,000 net new contracts, uh, uh, net ad additional net new contracts on the, on the personal side, personal line side. Commercial lines, we have passed on price increases, 1.6%, but this has uh, led to a, a revenue decline of 3.6% because we are relying more on brokers also because uh, with the uh, uh, recession uh, the exposures have declined uh, uh, but we are better this way and because we have been se um, selective on the underwriting by not renewing certain uh, commercial business in uh, certain countries where we were uh, not profitable but we are happy to have uh, this uh, pattern because uh, this is uh, good for future profitability. Now moving to the uh, earnings, sorry, maybe one, uh, one step back on this slide, you see that the two countries where uh, the uh, price increases are not happening are Switzerland and to some extent Germany. In Switzerland we have a combined ratio of 88.7%, uh, so it's not uh, too worrying. Germany, our combined ratio is uh, at 101, so this is a little bit worrying and this is, some, this is something that we will be continuing to, uh, to monitor. Moving to the uh, earnings picture, underlying earnings uh, uh, down 3% on a comparable basis. Again, a constructed, uh, contrasted picture between life and savings up 6%, PNC down 9%. Uh, maybe uh, uh, a word on international insurance, which uh, went up 17%. We had a good performance of uh, AXA Corporate Solutions, our largest business, which uh, ended the uh, half year with a combined ratio of 96.6%. Uh, so uh, this is uh, good in the current pricing environment and I will now uh, move to uh, comment the uh, life and savings side. On the life and savings side uh, where earnings were up 6%, we have again uh, a contrast between investment margins that are up 21% uh, and uh, fees and revenues up 9% but technical margin down 54%. Uh, I will uh, comment uh, each of those individually. Uh, I'm on page 22. On the investment margin side, uh, we have uh, seen a recovery of our investment margin to 77 basis points. Uh, if I take a slightly uh, longer time horizon, uh, in uh, 2008 for the full year, our investment margin was 80 basis points. 2009 for the full year, it was uh, 68 basis points. It's now back at 77. Uh, we believe that uh, we are capable of maintaining a, 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 um, an investment margin at that level in this uh, type of, uh, of environment. As we had told you, our uh, investment uh, income was down 10 basis points versus last year because we are reinvested at a slightly uh, lower rate. But uh, we were able to uh, also uh, slightly reduce our crediting rate. On the right end of the slide, we uh, give you uh, an illustration 
of the current situation and trying to project it for the uh, rest of the decade. Today, uh, we are earning 4%. The guaranteed rate on our portfolio is 2.5. We are effectively paying more than this because we have, uh, as I just said, 77 basis points of, uh, of margin. If we were to reinvest at 3.5% for the next 10 years, our earned rate would be 3.5%. At that point in time, because the new business has lower guarantees or no guarantees, our average guaranteed rate would be 1.9%. So uh, the spread between the two is roughly a constant. So we are relatively optimistic that we will be able to maintain our investment margin even in a relatively low interest rate environment. Uh, this is, I mean, you can make your own determination of whether 3.5% is conservative or not, but taking this as an assumption, uh, we believe is a realistic assumption at this stage. Technical margin uh, was the bad news of this uh, first half. There are two uh, uh, elements in this uh, decline of 54%. First, uh, we had a one-off gain last year on the restructuring of uh, our annuity portfolio in the UK. Uh, and we had high level of surrenders with uh, uh, surrender uh, penalties uh, in Japan. That's the first uh, half of the story. Second half of the story is uh, uh, hedging uh, of VAs in the US. Last year, we had a one-off positive on interest rate uh, hedging. This year, we have uh, suffered in the first half from high volatility and uh, high credit spreads, which meant that we had a loss on our hedging program in the US. Moving to PNC, our PNC earnings were down 9%. Uh, the, uh, there is good news and bad news here. The uh, good news is that uh, we have improved our current year combined ratio by 1.5 points. This was slightly more than offset by lower prior reserve developments, which moved from 8.2% to 6.5%, translating into a combined ratio which is slightly higher. Our expense ratio was stable. We had a uh, significantly lower investment income, which explains a uh, substantial part of the uh, decline in earnings. Uh, we try to give you a 10-year perspective on the um, prior reserve uh, developments, and you can see that uh, we've passed the peak of uh, positive uh, developments on prior, which is uh, normal, and we had told you that this would be the case uh, in the uh, current phase of the cycle. We are... We have passed the trough of the cycle, we believe, and we are now in a uh, rising pricing environment. So we would expect the prior, re uh, prior reserve development levels to continue to come down. You can also see on the bottom of the slide that we have been able to uh, maintain our reserving ratio as measured by uh, technical reserve divided by uh, earned premiums around uh, between 190 and 200%. Uh, throughout the period, and we've not weakened our reserving position uh, in, the, in the recent period. Asset management earnings were down, but when you analyze those uh, earnings, the reality is that pre-tax, those earnings were significantly up, with revenues up 10% and expenses up only 5%. We had a one-off tax positive uh, at Alliance Bernstein uh, last year, which uh, was not repeated, hence the uh, decline of the, uh, of the earnings. Uh, if we could focus on, the, um, uh, on what happened on the uh, 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 outflows uh, in our asset managers, first on the left side uh, uh, at Alliance Bernstein, uh, we had decreasing net outflows uh, from 33 billion in the first half of 2009 to uh, 8 billion uh, euros in the first half of 2010 with retail turning positive, uh, private clients uh, uh, break even, and institutional still with uh, net outflows. Uh, we have, uh, I would say, a good momentum at Alliance Bernstein in terms of uh, uh, gross uh, inflows, as uh, illustrated in the uh, release that Alliance Bernstein made uh, just a few days ago. At AXA IM, we had uh, a significant outflows of 17 billion in the first half. Uh, more than the totality of the outflows of AXA IM were uh, coming from uh, AXA Rosenberg. Uh, 
uh, with 15 billion uh, just in the second quarter. We have uh, changed management uh, and uh, the uh, organization at Axa Rosenberg. Uh, we took uh, in the holding segment a 64 million net provision related to uh, potential losses arising from the, the coding error that uh, uh, was discovered uh, in the first uh, half of this year. Uh, this was booked at the parent company level. We, are, uh, we have taken our best estimates of the net cost for the, uh, for the company. Uh, we are continuing to uh, uh, analyze the uh, impact on uh, the client accounts, and uh, we, uh, we hope that we will be able to uh, uh, put this uh, story behind us in the uh, second half of the year. Uh, adjusted earnings for the half year went up 29%. This is both because of a decline in the impairments and an increase in the uh, capital gains. Net, our capital gains uh, were uh, 200 million uh, euros, which uh, is in line with our uh, medium term, uh, uh, I would say medium term guidance. We've said that uh, we would be able to uh, generate between 300 and 500 million euros of capital gains per year. We generated 200 million in the first half. Uh, we had a uh, much lower level of impairments, uh, both uh, on equities and on uh, fixed income securities. Net income was down uh, 28% or up 81%, uh, excluding the UK uh, loss. Uh, we had uh, a slight benefit from uh, uh, alternative as from the improvement of the uh, situation of the alternative assets. Uh, a negative impact from the uh, spread widening, uh, a positive impact from uh, the uh, uh, equity derivatives program in the US, and a big negative from the uh, loss of the uh, sale of part of our, uh, of our legacy life operations to uh, resolution. I will uh, hand over now to Gérald for the uh, balance sheet. Thank you very much for your attention. Good afternoon. Uh, let's now move to the, to the balance sheet and starting with the uh, uh, solvency one uh, ratio. You can notice that uh, during the first half, uh, it improved from 171 to 188 uh, with two main components. First, the underlying earnings contribution and second, the market effects with two, two big uh, 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 components. The first one being the positive impact from interest rates net of the equity decline and net of the widening of the spreads, representing plus 18 points, and minus 10 com corresponding to the FX effect. Next, the shareholders' equity. The shareholders' equity over the period increased by 2.4 billion. And uh, uh, the main uh, elements are presented on the right hand side, uh, starting with the net income for the period, 0.9. The variation of unrealized capital gains, and uh, you can see on the left hand side, uh, uh, bottom left, uh, the uh, balance sheet net unrealized capital gains, and you will notice that uh, uh, the equity, uh, uh, the equities went down by point, uh, equity realized, uh, realized gain went down by 0.4, whereas interest rates increased by 1.6, net 1.2. The forex movement net of hedging, it's 2.1. And then you have the uh, deeply subordinated debt that corresponds to the interest for the period uh, on the uh, uh, perpetual uh, debt, uh, 0.2 billion. Then the pension deficit coming mostly from the decline in interest rates in the UK as well as in the US, it's minus 0.5. And uh, the dividend that was paid, minus 1.3 billion. Last, you can see uh, just on the, uh, at the, on the left hand side, uh, on the bottom of the slide, the off balance sheet net realized gain, which went up slightly uh, 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 from 2.6 to 2.9, and we have a, a, a slight appreciation of our real estate assets. Next, the uh, interest, the debt. Uh, during the period, the uh, debt went up from 13.5 to 16.1, so the 2.6 increase, in fact, has two components. The first one corresponding to the uh, uh, 
uh, uh, t to, to the FX, uh, to the effect of the, the decline of the euro. We have, as you know, we have uh, debts denominated in foreign currencies, and that the impact, 1.3. The second part corresponding to the uh, uh, tier 2 sub-debt that we raised uh, in April, and uh, which has been used in order to pay the collateral on uh, FX derivatives. On the right-hand side, you can notice that the debt ratio improved. That's a positive effect on the 29% uh, improvement of our adjusted earnings. Uh, the interest cover uh, uh, moving up from 7.9 times to 9.3. The debt gearing is at 29%, but uh, uh, if we include the 1.7 euro of expected cash from the UK transaction, a live transaction, then we will move down to 27 and uh, uh, if we update this level at the present level of uh, the foreign exchange rates, uh, it would be down to 26. Uh, the general accounts invested assets, you, can, uh, you, you notice that the uh, assets moved up from, 40, f f uh, from 403 to 446 billion euros. Uh, um, this 43 billion uh, increase is due to the foreign exchange for plus 15, the market effect plus 7, and the other elements being the uh, uh, operating cash flow as well as the investment income. You can notice that the fixed income percent, the, the assets invested in fixed income remain at 181%, with uh, Govis representing 40 and uh, uh, corporate bond 35. We slightly increased the, the uh, uh, investment in alternative investment, uh, that's uh, private equity and hedge funds. You can notice that uh, the estimated uh, uh, government bonds exposure for uh, the uh, southern European countries uh, did not move since uh, our last update. Then uh, uh, we, we uh, wanted to make a, a, a presentation on, uh, uh, on the, uh, report, based on the reported DV. So what's the life and savings normalized underlying capital generation? It's a normalized uh, 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 presentation. And you can, you can see that uh, starting first with life, uh, 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 we, we can expect in, 20, in the first half of, uh, of 10 uh, to have a, 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 a free uh, surplus, a live free surplus uh, between 0.4 and 0.5. It doesn't take into account the positive effect of the UK uh, uh, business that has been disposed because it was a capital intense uh, uh, business. And uh, uh, this compared to the previous year uh, between 0.8 and 1 billion. When uh, adding the uh, other business lines, uh, first PNC, uh, PNC it's a contribution of 1.1, including the international business, and then uh, we have the asset management at 0.1, and the change in local solvency requirement for PNC and, and asset management are quite small, uh, below uh, 0.1. So as a whole, it's uh, for the first half uh, between 0.5 and 0.6 of uh, free cash flow, uh, uh, which uh, uh, we see holding underlying earnings uh, at minus 0.4 and the interest charge on uh, perpetual debt at minus 0.2, which makes uh, between 1 and 1.1 compared with uh, 2 in 09 and uh, in 08, uh, 3.2. Uh, um, so that's, uh, that's the first approach. Again, I mentioned that it was a, a, a normalized underlying cash generation. And uh, there, is, there will be more to come at the next IR day in, in November. And uh, uh, we will present you how we uh, intend to improve our cash uh, generation. Thank you, Gérald. So... As a conclusion, I think the model is simple. Uh, once more for this first half, the business model has proven its resilience. You've seen that in the earnings. What do we intend to do going forward? More of the same. If you look at that, we have tried to characterize what we want to do. It's try to redeploy capital and accelerate growth on life and saving side and on property casualty on the segments which are generating significant margins and volume growth, which means if you look at life and savings, protection and health, unit linked, more than general account and savings products. By geography, high growth markets, not only Asia, but also the mid region, Central and Eastern Europe, possibly Latin America, less the more 
major countries like France or the uh, US. On the property casualty side, margin enhancement on the retail lines and on commercial lines, knowing that it's going to be easier to grow the volumes on individual, because there the strength of the brand is really attractive and we have been able, as you've seen during the first half, to increase the portfolios by approximately 700,000 clients, despite the price increases. In commercial lines, you know it's more difficult. So that's where we are, uh, and we are now ready to take your questions. Yep. Yeah, I think there is a mic which is on its way. I've got a question on slide 22 on the investment margins. Um, I'm slightly confused by this slide because my understanding was that a large proportion of your investment margin comes from a percentage participation in profits. So if yields are going down, then you know, by definition, the percentage share of your profit must go down unless you actually change that ratio um, of participation. So could you just explain that? And then second related question is, um, when you show sort of guaranteed rates, when you show guaranteed rates going down, how much of that is active reduction and how much of it is just the por portfolio effect of, of, of new business? Yeah. Uh, on, the first, uh, on your first question relative to the investment margin, uh, in fact, the investment margin are increasing in, in two countries compared with the first half. It's first France and second Switzerland. Uh, as far as France is concerned, uh, yes, we have a, a, a participation rate, but uh, last year we didn't, uh, uh, we didn't uh, get the full uh, effect of uh, our margin. So that means that last year, roughly speaking, in France, we had an 80 basis points margin where we can uh, get 100 basis points margin. So. Uh, on the income side in France, we decreased, we, we decreased only slightly by even less than 10 basis points uh, uh, our investment return. And uh, at the same time, due to, uh, due to our disciplined uh, 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 distribution and crediting rate, we can take uh, and we, 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 we consider that this rate, this year, we will benefit from the full, uh, from the full margin. In, uh, in Switzerland, it's the same, it's, it's the same case. Uh, on the second part uh, uh, of your question, which is uh, uh, the guaranteed rate, so this, uh, the, the right part of this slide number 22, takes into account the guaranteed rates that we have in different countries, and it's a runoff of the existing guaranteed rates plus the new business. And as you know, uh, over the last years, we have been uh, 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 very active in uh, limiting the guaranteed rates. So that means that a significant part of uh, the new uh, general account business that we are selling uh, don't have any guaranteed rates. It's a pure portfolio effect. Basically. Uh, so it's a pure portfolio effect. And this is, I mean, we, the, the, this, the bottom part of this slide we've been probably showing since 2005. At the time, we were at, at 3%, and we, would, we had said it would move gradually to 25 and to 2 and we are just reproducing this. We are in line with our, with our plan. Our new business is mostly without uh, guarantees or with a 0% guarantee. Therefore, it's a pure portfolio effect. So j just to be clear on part one of your answer, you are basically effectively paying out a larger participation than your statutory ratio, yeah, let's say, you have to, let's say, in a country, you have to pay 80% of your profit. Now you paid 85. Now you've reduced that back. Yes. Yeah, yeah. To exactly. So, so are you now at the limit? Are you now close no, to? No, no. You still have room. Could, could you quantify yes. that? No, we, we still have room, but uh, we can consider that uh, uh, to take to take again the examples I took on France, 100 basis points is a sustainable level. Uh, overall, for the group, uh, you. I mean, you. you uh, you saw the figure on the slide. 80, we were at 86 basis points in, in first half of 08, 80 for the full year. I believe that uh, it's reasonable to assume that we can be around 80 basis points uh, for the group as a whole. Okay, thank you. Next question. Yeah. Nick. Nick Holmes at Namura. I had a, a couple of questions. First one is a um, strategic question. Looking at the way that you're changing the shape of the group, I wondered, can you give us a sort of indication 
of what uh, geographic mix you would ideally like to have, say, in three years' time? Uh, I mean, it, it's a difficult question, I know, to answer. And, I mean, the areas uh, that you're looking to expand in are obviously the growth markets, but um, what is the sort of percentage of growth versus say, the more mature markets that you would look to have, say, in three years' time. And as a follow-on to that question, where are the areas that look to you to be perhaps a little um, uh, more susceptible to potential disposal? Um, I mean, the UK, Australia are areas that uh, you are or have disposed of. And um, just wondered if you could share your views on that. Then... Second question is perhaps a little bit more uh, simple and is for Kevin, um, which uh, is how sustainable do you think the recovery in the variable annuity sales is uh, that we've seen in Q2? And um, in ranking terms, I mean, you, your, your ranking in VA slipped to number six, I think, in 09. And I uh, wondered if you could sort of share thoughts about what kind of level of ranking you might be targeting this year. Okay. Uh, on, on the first part of the question, Nick, uh, we are pragmatic people, so there is no magic number in terms of uh, uh, spread of the business mix geographically. But the trends are clear. It's not that we don't want to grow in developed countries. I mean, if you look at the world going forward, 80% of the new growth or new value is going to be in developed countries. So we still have to be there, but the pace at which it's going in emerging is faster. So we want to accelerate in emerging. We want also to accelerate some product lines, even in developed. And this was the very last slide I showed you. We think we have a significant room for growth in protection, in health, possibly in long-term care, if the reforms are structured the way we want to see them structured. And if you look at the numbers for the first half, you will see that protection has been growing at approximately between 8 and 10% overall, which is a strong growth number with very good margins. Uh, and we think that this is something we should do more of, even in developed countries. As far as emerging countries are concerned, it's Asia, it's Central and Eastern Europe, it's some countries in the Med region, and possibly South America or Latin America. There, in terms of business mix, there is a difference depending on if you look at the uh, existing business or if you look at the new business. Look at the new business value. A very significant proportion of the new business value in life is already coming from emerging countries or from new countries. But we will live for a number of years with the legacy portfolios of the developed ones. Where are the places where we would be ready to do more, uh, to do less, sorry, and how can we do less? Uh, you can do less not only by selling. You can do less by reducing the amount of business you write. Look at what we've been doing as an example in France for the first half. The fact that we did not underwrite large policies which had low margins has an impact on the, uh, uh, on the growth of revenues in the French market. But it's a way to redeploy capital because you don't have to, by definition, to immobilize the capital you would have had to put in front of these policies. It's freeing up capital, which we can redeploy in other markets. So you do not necessarily need to sell. You just can stop underwriting in certain places and put the focus on other business lines or other uh, geographies. So the tendency should be more growth in retail lines, in protection, in health, and in emerging countries, less growth in saturated markets, and pragmatic disposals or reductions in underwriting where needed. Uh, to give you very precise uh, uh, splits between the various business lines, I wouldn't go there because I think it's something where we have to stay very flexible. Is this? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's great. You, you haven't mentioned variable annuities in Europe or Asia. I wonder if that is a core cool I mean, product for you still. Yeah, it remains a very interesting product for the long run. The, uh, uh, I think what we all have in mind is the fact that 
the savings component of the life business is in a difficult spot these days because you have low long-term interest rates, high volatility and equity markets going nowhere. So this is making the savings component of the life business difficult. It's probably not going to last forever, even if it can last for some time. We think that long term, the variable annuities have not lost their attraction. You just have to structure them differently. And from that standpoint, if you look at what has been done with Retirement Cornerstone, we think it's pretty successful. The sales are growing. If you look at the proprietary network, which we are controlling well, and Kevin will elaborate on that, but Cornerstone is representing a growing proportion of the sales, is well accepted and is profitable. So the don't throw the baby out with the bass. Variable annuities have shown weaknesses in the turmoil because of the tail risks and because of the volatility. It doesn't mean that the product is a bad product for the future. It could be a very good product if repriced and in slightly different uh, uh, economic circumstances. Kevin, do you want to answer on that? So Nick, thanks for the, thanks for the easy question. Um, I think what you'll see from us in uh, the second quarter, as Denise said, we will, we will not pick a um, tremendous amount of market share. We do expect we're picking up some market share. And we do expect to continue sort of this steady growth. We're not looking to be number one or number two or number three. Our products are well priced when we're looking at delivering on the margins as opposed to you know, being the most aggressive uh, products in the market. So the retirement cornerstone is, is rolling out pretty much as expected. Remember, we just introduced it in, re in, the, in the wholesale or third-party channel in the second quarter. And sales are, you know, the introduction to those channels are, is occurring and any momentum. So we're, we're pleased with where we are, but don't expect that we're going we're gonna to slide to number, you know, one, two, or three in the next, in the next quarters. Well, it's a, it's a very um, mixed market in the VA world. You have some companies that have, been, um, have gained a lot of market share um, over the last year uh, and, have, and have pretty much locked on to the top three positions or so. And then you have other companies who have decided to either not play in the market or at a significant reduction. We, are, we ended up the first uh, quarter and the end of last year in about five or six uh, place in the, in the market, which is, uh, which is, let's say, comfortable. And I think we will remain in that space because I don't see us uh, overtaking the top three in, anytime soon. Whoever, Christian, who, who is closer to the mic? <laughs> Christian, this time. Thank you, Henri. Um, a question on the slide 33 about your debt and leverage, please, maybe for, for Gerard. Um, if my um, back of the envelope calculations are right, your um, debt gearing goes from 29 to 27, then you complete the UK transaction. Um, then you use the proceeds of the new lower tier 2 to pay down the 1.3, and then presumably we get close to 25%, just sort of round numbers. Now, the question then really is, are you happy in the future for that to go back up to 35 and um, considering you've probably been the most proactive in terms of issuing debt, you assume will work under um, Solvency 2. Where do you see the future range of the debt gearing um, once Solvency 2 eventually comes into play, please? Okay. Uh, w w what I told you is that uh, we, uh, uh, we were presently, in fact, at 29, right? Uh, taking into account the 1.6 billion, we would be back to 27. What I said is that taking into account today's FX rates, uh, uh, since a, a significant part of our debt is denominated in foreign currency, we would be back to 26. Uh, 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 but at the same time, uh, 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 we, we can consider that uh, being at a level which is below 30 or around 30 is, uh, is the right level. In other terms, to exceed 30, it would have to be something really strategically compelling. Thank you. Oliver Steele at Deutsche Bank. Um, just one question on the acquisition expenses on the life side, which seem to have fallen back quite sharply uh, and against the trend of new business. So I'm just wondering what's happening there. Is, is that something to do with the more selective uh, new business targeting that you've got, uh, and is it a sustainable number? Uh, the, the, the acquisition expenses uh, went down quite significantly due to the DAC. 
It means that, uh, 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 as you noticed and as explained by Denis, the technical margin in the U.S. went down quite significantly, and some of the, and and uh, mostly coming from the from the U.S. from the GMXB margin, and uh, one part of it is offset by deferred acquisition cost. So we have a negative impact, so a positive impact in terms of positive contribution to earnings, uh, coming from uh, from the uh, from the GMXB. Yep. Uh, Mark Tiller, UBS. Um, one question on um, this Australia situation. Can you can you provide us with a time frame? How long you sort of wait for NAB to sort this out with a regulator before you move on elsewhere or think about alternatives? Um, the second question is, how much of the UK business that you are about to dispose? How much earnings have been contributed into these underlying earnings numbers? So we can adjust our model for that. And then thirdly, I think in the past you mentioned a normal tax rate of 25 to 26%. Is that still a good number to work with? Okay. I'll take the first question. On the Australian deal, we are like the Catholic Church. We are ready to endure a lot of pain to go to paradise. And we have the eternity for us. Uh, more seriously, uh, as you know, it's a discussion between the uh, ACCC and NAB to see if NAB can satisfy some of the, uh, or deal with some of the objections which have been put forward by the ACCC. They've been discussing now for weeks. We have the feeling that it's getting close to a conclusion. If uh, 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 the ACCC finds that the undertakings uh, uh, made by uh, NAB are acceptable, they will consult the market before making their final decision. Uh, there is no precise timetable at this stage. We hope to see some evolution in the coming weeks. Uh, would you uh, just, uh, just add one point? Uh, since this is the deal that has been uh, recommended by the uh, independent directors of XIPH, as long as we are in that position, this is uh, our best uh, uh, way forward. Yeah. It's in the interest of the shareholders and in our interest to, at this stage, see this thing going on. And as I told you before, I think if you look, I mean, it's, it, of course it's frustrating, but if you, look at the, uh, if you look at the numbers, you will see that the Southeast Asian operations have been performing well in the first half, which is, to a certain extent, the justification of the strategic choice we've made. It's worse to be patient if, at the end of the day, you can come to the conclusion you want to see. Uh, Gérald, do you want to take the question on the Gérald or, uh, yeah, yeah. or Jean on, on, the, on the UK, the contribution to the uh, earnings? Uh, yeah, on, on the UK, the total contribution of UK to the earnings, as uh, you can see in the, uh, uh, in the uh, uh, MDNA, is uh, uh, 119 million euros and, uh, uh, in the first half, and the retained business is a loss of 48, and the sold business is a profit of 167. Uh, uh, for sure, the, uh, uh, the, as far as the NBV is concerned, it's exactly the reverse in terms of proportion because uh, out of 56 NBV uh, uh, for the period, the retained business represents 41%, so uh, a significant, uh, vast majority of this NBV. In million. Million, yes. Million euros. Can I do a question in the middle between this? Yeah. Yeah, tax rates. Uh, yes, it, it's, it's a good question because uh, in reality, uh, we, we are, are using, we have always published our uh, figures on a post tax basis, and this is uh, how we show a 3% decline in our underlying earnings. In reality, on a pre tax basis, both on uh, underlying and on net income, we have a growth in uh, half year 010 versus half year 09, which means that the totality of our uh, deterioration of performance between 09 and 010 is due to an increased tax rate. We had uh, large one-offs last year. Uh, we have uh, much lower one-offs uh, positive this year, uh, but I still believe that 25 to 26 is a good guidance uh, medium term. Yeah, Andrew, maybe, uh, and then Bob. 
Or Bob and Andrew, as you like. <laughs> um, but, yeah, Bob Yates at Macquarie. Um, two questions. One on the savings side. You've demonstrated, I, I think, that you think you can maintain margins on an IFRS basis on the overall life book um, in current conditions. Can you improve new business margins on your savings product globally from the 10% that you're showing? And what does 10% correspond to roughly in terms of IRR? Uh, that, that's one question. The second is on the reserve runoff um, in PNC, it's, um, it's, it's been over a wide range over the years, but what are you pricing for and reserving for? And what do you think it will decline to and settle at in the future? Good. <laughs> okay. On, on, uh, on savings, uh, you, you are touching a, uh, a sore point, a uh, very, very good point. Uh, we are not happy with our margins on the savings side. Uh, and uh, we are not happy with our internal rate of return on the savings side. Uh, the... Uh, uh, this uh, is uh, largely because uh, uh, we, uh, I mean, we have not been used to uh, such a low interest rate environment, uh, and the, uh, we are closer to the uh, guaranteed levels. Uh, therefore, we uh, definitely need to uh, to uh, uh, rethink the way we uh, uh, we write uh, savings products uh, going forward. We believe that a part of the answer, as Henri said before, is variable annuities. We've been, we, have negative, we had negative surprises in 08 on our VAs, but we have repriced our VAs to, in a way such that we believe that it is possible to uh, write profitably variable annuities in the current interest rate environment, and we uh, have an acceptable uh, margin and acceptable IR overall on our VA portfolio uh, right now. Uh, we believe another uh, part of the answer is uh, an increasing proportion of unit link business. Uh, and uh, in France, uh, as we uh, uh, indicated, we, are, we have done two things. We have uh, differentiated our commission ratios to our distributors, increasing commissions for a higher unit link proportion. Uh, and we have started also to uh, differentiate crediting rates uh, for customers that uh, take a part of their, uh, uh, I mean, that, that, right, that uh, subscribe to products that have a higher proportion of unit linked uh, business, because on pure uh, general account savings business, we believe that we cannot, in a current interest rate environment, have an acceptable uh, internal rate of return uh, and the new business value margin. So those are two uh, uh, of the key uh, elements for our, the savings uh, solution. Gérald, any other uh, thoughts on no, savings? Uh, uh, just uh, just uh, to, to uh, you asked about the, the level of the internal rate of return, just refer to the uh, EV report at the end of last year and you will notice that in France, for example, where most of the pro uh, significant part of these products are savings products, the average uh, internal rate of return is 9%. So we can expect that uh, for us as Denis said, for general account products, we are, let's say, between 5 and 10, and uh, for protection products, we are more uh, at 15. On, on property casualty, sorry, you should go back to page 25, if you could have it on the screen. So, so this is very much cycle dependence on, on PNC. Uh, we believe that uh, uh, I mean, in the way we, we uh, look at it right now, uh, an average rate should be of the order of 4%. Uh, but this, uh, but we, we expect to talk to you more about this uh, at our autumn, autumn seminar in, uh, in November. But 4% uh, would be uh, probably an, uh, a, good, uh, a good number. But, but if you look at this chart, I think it's interesting because you will see that the reserving ratio has remained stable, which is a very clear illustration of the fact that we have not impoverished the company by releasing too much. I mean, the, res the reserving remains a very strong one. We are benefiting from the fact that we, we've been very, very cautious in the good years. And what current pricing allow you to take 4% without cannibalizing the reserves of the earlier accident years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right now, I mean, yes. right now we have, uh, I mean, in uh, 010, we have not weakened our reserving position. Uh, that's absolutely clear. Are we happy with the uh, current level of prices and our current level of no. combined ratio? Clearly not. We, uh, we, we've, we show you uh, 
current year combined ratio, which is pessimistic of 104.6, because we are reserving conservatively in this 104.6. But uh, if we look at our economic combined ratio, it's still above 100%, which means that we are, we are making an underwriting loss on, uh, on new business, and we're not happy with that. Uh, hello, it's Andrew Crean at Autonomous Research. Th uh, three questions. Firstly, um, will you be publishing Quiz 5 numbers when you've got them, as you did with Quiz 4, um, to give us some view of um, economic uh, capital going forward? Secondly, um, you tend, from your new capital uh, generation disclosure, you tend to reinvest around about three quarters of your back book cash flows in new business on what are um, relatively modest IRRs, particularly on the savings side. Um, do you have an intention um, to try and limit the amount of new business that you write um, and be more disciplined about the IRRs you get so that more of the cash from the back books leaks down into the, uh, to the shareholders? And thirdly, could you talk a little bit about guaranteed annuity options? I know guarantees um, scare people, but it's the annuity options where um, it's more difficult for you to analyse um, how to hedge them. Could you talk about where you have annuity options, how you hedge them, and if you have policyholder behaviour wrong, how significant could that be? On QIS5, uh, we will see what the industry position is going to be on that. Uh, I mean, we have discussions at the Panel Open Insurance Forum to see what we will, uh, we will do. Uh, and we will, we will follow the industry. I mean, we, we, we have our own view. Uh, we have the feeling that, I mean, just to speak not about the disclosure but about the substance, we have the feeling that, say, QIS5 is an improvement when compared to what some of the expectations about QIS5 were. But we still think that there are areas where the requirements are largely excessive. The calibrations are wrong. The requirements are largely excessive. Uh, to take a very simple example, and one thing among many, uh, why should the requirements on property casualty risks increase following the financial crisis? I mean, to what extent is the uh, frequency of car accidents increased by a financial crisis? So far, I have had trouble making the connection between these two elements. Sorry? <laughs> Maybe. No, but they are this just to say that we have the feeling that some things are still wrong. Interestingly, on the calibration of the financial risk, the view of the industry, CFO, CRO Forum and Pan European Insurance Forum, is pretty pretty close to the view of the regulators. The points where we disagree still very strongly are mostly on non financial risks which is a paradox, and which gives us the feeling that uh, uh, there is still an exercise of trying to, uh, I would say, buy comfort by asking for excessive requirements. The way we put it very, very simply when we are faced to people who are not familiar with the issue is to say what the Parliament has been voting for is a 99.5 probability of default with a one-year horizon. 0.5. Sorry, uh, um, 0 0.5, sorry, yes, 99.5 certitude of survival. So 0.5% of default with a one-year horizon. Since you have 5,000 insurance companies in Europe, this should allow for 25 defaults a year. Cumulative in the last five years, you've had 16 defaults. So this is demonstrating that the industry is sufficiently capitalized. You could add that most of these defaults were very tiny companies. I mean, not noticeable. So we do not see why there should be any increase globally in the capital requirements. And Barnier has stated that, that he was not expecting the exercise to uh, uh, end with more capital than what is already the case. You can have more capital in some business lines. You also should have less in others. This is not what we are seeing at this stage. So. If we are not satisfied with QIS files, we will say that we are not satisfied and we will push forward. Sorry, uh, on the other questions, 
Daniel Gérald. Uh, on, on new business trainer, I'd like to uh, say a word, but uh, then leave the rest of the question to, uh, to Gérald. Uh, the, the transaction that we are doing in the UK uh, is part of the answer. Uh, we are in, when, when we sell uh, to resolution our traditional uh, portfolio, we remove uh, a large part of the new business strain of our UK life uh, business because we, uh, in, in the, the, what we are keeping, the wealth management business, it's RDR ready. Uh, and uh, we have a very little, uh, very little strain. So uh, new business strain in large part is commissions, and uh, the, uh, these commissions are a function of uh, market practices to a large extent. Uh, if we move up markets, we, re we reduce this new business strain. Uh, and uh, so it's, uh, it's uh, really trying to move to a different way of, uh, of uh, operating in the, uh, in the market. And we are trying to do some of that, but it's, uh, it's, it will be uh, dependent uh, mark on, on each market, and it's not something that is uh, easy, uh, easy, to, uh, easy to do. Uh, Gérald, any additional thoughts on that? Uh, uh, no, to, to answer the last part of the question, which was about the guaranteed uh, annuity options, you know, uh, like all options, uh, 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 we have uh, examples with uh, the GMAB, for example, in the US. It's managed like an option. That means that uh, uh, the customer behavior is, uh, 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 is uh, 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 planned. Uh, uh, depending on the interest rate. So when interest rates are going down, which is presently the case, we are assuming, and there is a formula which explains by how much uh, uh, the percentage of, uh, the percentage of uh, 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 policyholders that will take an annuity will increase. Uh, what I can tell you, so we are applying it, and that's the way we are on a day-to-day -day basis managing our options. What I can tell you is that up to now, uh, we didn't notice any uh, 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 different behavior from policyholders than the one we, have, we had anticipated. Uh, but, but, uh, apart from the U.S., uh, in many, many in many of our markets where we have uh, guaranteed annuity options, we uh, have uh, uh, anticipated customer behaviors which were 100% annuitization. Uh, because this has been the practice of the market, this 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 is the practice of the market uh, uh, in France for uh, for annuities. It's the practice of the market in Germany, uh, and uh, in uh, and for the most part in Japan. Uh, so in in many of the uh, of and our that's, and, and that, that that was included in the slide. Uh, uh, on the guaranteed rate, so it's yes. part of the guaranteed rates that they've been. Uh, so, in, uh, in many of our, in a large portion of our book, those guaranteed annuity options are already reserves as as if exercised all the time. Yeah, Blair. Thanks very much, Blair Stewart, B of A Merrills. Uh, two questions. The first, uh, actually, they're both in the U.S. Um, could you talk a little bit more about the new product? Um, uh, downside protection with upside potential. It sounds like an index annuity. Uh, can you talk a bit about that and, and the profitability expectations? And um, a more general point in the US, are you finding yourselves at a competitive disadvantage against some of the US players who are perhaps not pricing on an economic stroke solvency 2 basis? I take the second part before Kevin takes the first one. Depends on the way you can position it. Yes, to a certain extent, you can say that if you have competitors who are not managing against the same benchmarks as your benchmarks, uh, uh, you are at a disadvantage, but that's life. We are not going to endanger the company just because other people are managing against uh, uh, different standards. I think at this stage, it leaves us a sufficient room uh, uh, to compete uh, uh, and do what we have to do. If, uh, uh, if the divergence were to become much, much, much larger, then maybe we would have a question, but I don't think it's the case today. Uh. On, the, uh, on the new product we have coming out in the fall, hopefully, or early winter, it's, uh, it is similar to an index annuity, but it's a very, if you look at our product set in the U.S. for variable annuities, we have more complex variable annuities like accumulator. We have retirement cornerstones now that is gaining momentum. Now, this new product, Protected Strategies, will be a, a way for people who are looking for short, shorter term tax advantage um, investing. And so uh, it'll offer downside protection with limited upside. And so in this market where people are concerned about uh, you know, down markets, it'll, it'll fill that need. So we're looking to sort of complete our product set to from shorter short duration investors all the way through to those people who are planning full into retirement. 
Well, right. It's, it, first of all, a couple of things blurring that. One, it's a, it's a shorter term product, one, three, or five years. Uh, it's priced sort of at the market when, it's, uh, when it becomes available. So we're targeting, uh, we're targeting profitability as we would for, for all annuities with appropriate new business values in line that we have with uh, when, we, when we introduce Retirement Cornerstone. Uh -huh. If I may go back to the first, uh, to the first question, uh, Blair, uh, we, we do not intend to compete in all segments of uh, all markets. So uh, uh, in the U.S., we never competed in the whole life market, which is a market dedicated to mutuals, which have a lower hurdle rate. Uh, since 2002, we have stopped competing in the fixed annuity market because we were pricing to, uh, I would say, European embedded value market consistent pricing, and we were happy not to compete in that market, and we uh, take, took a much less uh, asset risk than our competitors by not being in the fixed annuity market. It's true now that uh, in the VA market, we are uh, probably compete, not competing in the totality of the market because we uh, have uh, more stringent risk management, uh, uh, I would say, uh, constraints. But we still believe that there is an addressable market that is big enough for us to uh, be successful. Yes, sorry. I have a question regarding the outlook for the non-life business. Uh, so you recorded a 3% average rate increase in the first half of the year. Uh, how, how would you describe your pricing strategy in the second half, uh, considering the prolonged economic weakness? How are you approaching the French market, for instance? Are you confident you could replicate similar rate of increases? More of the same. Uh, and, and, and we think that, I mean, it's contrasted from one market to the other, but we think we can uh, continue to push. One illustration of that is the fact that we've been pushing significant price increases in different countries, and despite that, we've been growing the number of, uh, uh, the number of policies for the group as a whole by 700,000, which means that the attractiveness of the brand and the quality of the service is enough for us to maintain acceptable, uh, um, I would say, gross rates in the portfolios, despite the fact that prices are increasing. And I think this is one of the strengths of the, uh, of the proprietary networks. Since we were early in the uh, repricing, I believe that we will benefit from the situation because as our competitors start increasing our pri their prices, uh, after us, this gives us further opportunities to uh, uh, continue to, uh, to, uh, to follow with uh, additional price increases. Do we have questions on the phone? We have a, we have a question from Mr. Jean Derpecourt from Chevrolet. Sir, please go ahead. Yeah, do you, do you, good afternoon. Do you hear me? Yes. Okay. okay. I have a couple of questions. First of all, looking at the uh, latest KISS 5 calibration, um, would you recognize uh, under this uh, latest framework some excess of reserves um, as you want to push the idea that you are highly reserved, um, especially in PNC and uh, hoping, hoping that, uh, that the, the next framework also from, um, uh, from the ISB uh, will uh, match uh, what SEOPS is, uh, is proposing? So that's my first question. My second question is, using a constant uh, equity market, um, what, uh, um, what further impairments on uh, asset could be booked uh, on H2 and uh, going forward? And um, I have a third question on uh, AXA Rosenberg. Um, I'm just wondering if uh, the 64 million uh, reserves that you've put on the side um, for restructuring and potentially compensation are realistic. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Gérald, do you want to take the first part of the question? On, on, the, uh, um, on the, the, you mentioned, first I'll start with the, const, with the equity. Uh, uh, you, you asked uh, what, in case the equity market will stay where it is today, what would be the impact? Yeah. Roughly speaking, uh, 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 the impact would be around 100 million net, but what we said, remember, uh, uh, at, the, at, the, um, at the end, that, that was in February, we said that uh, we, we should, uh, 
be in a capacity to realize some capital gains on a net basis, net of impairment between 300 and 500. You notice that in the first half we did 200, so there is uh, no way for us not uh, uh, to comply with what we said uh, uh, at the beginning of the, of the year between 300 and, and, and 500 million. Uh, 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 on on KISS 5, I believe it's, it's far too early uh, today uh, to, to, to give any, uh, any uh, indication on uh, uh, what we will mean. You know that uh, the KISS 5 exercise uh, will, uh, will be between, uh, during uh, uh, starting this month up to, up to November. Uh, and anyway, uh, the problem of the PNC uh, your specific problem about the PNC reserving, you know, it's, it's balanced. So that means that uh, uh, if you have an excess of, of reserves, then it goes to the, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, uh, shareholders' equity and it will be accounted as uh, available financial resources. So that's, uh, 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 that's the way I would uh, answer your question. And on Rosenberg, if we have put this level of reserve, it's that we feel it's sufficient. Another question on the phone? No? We have no further questions. Thank you. Another question in the room? Yes? Hi. Hi. I'm from uh, City. Just two questions on your uh, GA uh, book, please. In terms of the investment margin, which is 77 bips, uh, could you talk about uh, what role ALM plays and how you've changed your matching position? Because obviously that will drive uh, your reinvestment rate in a low interest rate environment. So that's question one. The second one was uh, the forecast over the next uh, 10 years or nine years. Uh, is there any assumption of a changing uh, portfolio, asset portfolio in that built in at all, or is it uh, just using the same portfolio? I see you've changed a little bit your asset portfolio uh, with a higher weightage to alternative assets. Yes. Uh, uh, your first question about ALM, for sure ALM uh, plays a role in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, uh, improvement in the margin. And where does it come from mostly? It comes from the fact that as much as possible we are matching assets with liabilities. That means that we had uh, up to now we have a, a, an average uh, duration for life of uh, seven years, for PNC six years roughly, so that explains that's why we, we didn't suffer from a decrease in interest rates. That means that when interest rates, when govies went down by 60, 70 basis points, uh, uh, we are, uh, the impact on our portfolio is, is pretty low. So, that's, uh, so the main uh, reason is this one. The second one is ALM means also uh, 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 the best way to align uh, uh, liabilities with assets in life is to maximize the percentage of uh, fixed income. And as you as I presented to you, uh, we are above 80%. And in fact, we, are, we were right. Uh, uh, as far as the, the, the second part of your question uh, for, for guaranteed rates, yes, we assumed that uh, the uh, asset allocation would stay exactly the same. So that means that we are, we are assuming that we would renew uh, uh, at uh, today's uh, uh, low rates. So that's everything equal. Yes. Go ahead. Hi, I just thought I'd follow up on that, actually. Could you, just going back to I mean, this whole subject of margins, could you just tell us, that of that investment margin, what proportion is coming from spread-based annuity-type products and what proportion is coming from a profit share? <laughs> exact numbers, please. Uh, okay. <laughs> I think we'll, we'll ask Mathieu and the IR team to come back to, to you on follow, this one. Uh, to follow up on that. Okay. Yeah. Okay, uh, Blair. <laughs> Blair. Blair. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, it's me again. Uh, given X is now a yield stock, um, <laughs> I thought you'd like that. Um, what to be thinking about in terms of the dividend? This is a year where there's, there's limited growth and a lot of discipline from you. Is there a temptation to move up the scale in your dividend payout towards the higher end uh, in such a year with a view to moving it down when, when growth uh, conditions may, get better? May I remind you of what the long-term policy is, which is unchanged. It's between 40 and 50 percent of the adjusted. And as you've seen, adjusted has not been flat in the first half. Yeah, no, no, the payout, I'm not going to move the, pay up, the payout up. We are at the, I mean, between 40 and 50. So far, we are at, we are at 40.
Yeah, Nick. Just a, a quick follow-up question on PNC. I wondered, um, given that your level of uh, reserve ratio and reserve releases is uh, considerably higher than most of your peer group, and this, I understand, is due to the longer tail uh, nature of some of your business, like partly the construction. We see, uh, partly only, because we, we think that structurally the reserving is more conservative. Well, I, I, yes, I, I was hesitating to ask you about that, but you, you would, you would <laughs> actually say that publicly, would you? Right. Um, <laughs> um, my, 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 my question was actually whether the, the tail is growing over the last few years, whether the liability, I think you said six years uh, average uh, liability profile. Um, is that something that has grown over the last four years, would you say? Has the mix of your business no. been to... No, we, we, I would say the proportion of uh, commercial versus retail has probably, uh, the, the retail part has probably slightly increased. In the commercial book, we have probably moved a little bit more towards uh, a liability uh, and construction. So within the commercial, we've probably slightly uh, increased the uh, uh, increased the, uh, the tail, but we have also increased the, the, the individual more than the commercial, and this probably the two are, are, are phenomena of, of set each other. Okay, um, because I think I recall, was it um, last year? You said average level of reserve release is more like 3 to 4%, and you're sort of going more to the 4% level as, as the average. Uh -huh. That's 3 to 4 or 4, I, well, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think it's, it's, I, could, I, could, I should have said 3 to 4. But <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. Ah, question coming up. It's like at auctions. <laughs> Bob. <laughs> Bob. I'm just wondering about the technical margin. Um, I wonder if you've ever guided on that, because it's, um, it's annualized about a billion a year, which is probably between 30 and 40 bips on technical reserves. So w would you expect it to stay around that level? Obviously, if you're successfully increasing protection, it, it could go up. But it's a, it's a nice, could be a potentially stable number if we could know what that is, perhaps. Uh, um, on technical margin in life, your question is on life. Yes. Uh, uh, on life. Uh, uh, so when we exclude the impact of the GMXB, uh, uh, we can consider that everything equal, we have a capacity roughly of uh, 900, 900 million. Remember that last year we had a one-off, uh, uh, which was coming from the, from the UK. Every six months. Every six months, yes. I'm, I'm referring to the half year for sure. Uh, 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 and, but that's everything equal, for sure. Uh, uh, when uh, progressively expanding the percentage of protection business, this technical margin will go up. Uh, I think there was another question. Yeah. Julia. Hi. Uh, thank you. Uh, one question is just a, a follow up on the uh, technical margin. When you say 900 million for six months, would that be assuming? Um, uh, the U.S. Uh, at zero, or is there a chance that uh, the U.S. will um, produce a no? That's that's assumed. That's assumed that in the U.S. it would be zero. So that means that we we exclude the loss corresponding to the GMXP in the first half. And can this come if uh, uh, the interest rates stay uh, same level? Uh, as sorry, the first half uh, and the VIX. Uh, uh, I'm just asking if the US can st be uh, at zero if uh, uh, no, the interest it, it, rates stay okay. no, where it, they are and the VIX. Uh, okay, it's, it's, it's depending on various factors. You are right saying that one of the most important factors is the volatility. Uh, so it will, it will depend on the volatility. We have been suffering from a high volatility level, volatility level in the first half. And, 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 and we will see at the same time the, what we can expect, but uh, uh, we don't know. We, we suffered also from a widening of the spreads uh, uh, on the corporate bond in, in the first half. So uh, uh, you have a combination of these two negative effects. So, but I, I, cannot, uh, uh, I cannot make any, any, any uh, uh, 
uh, uh, give you any outlook because it will depend on the markets. And uh, my second question, sorry, is just on the uh, PNC side. Can you tell us what the difference is between uh, the new money uh, reinvestment and the uh, running yield on the uh, portfolio? Uh, on, the, on the asset side, uh, yes. Uh, roughly, yeah. Mathieu, you have about 4% of the asset yield. I think on the asset yield we are slightly above 4%. Yeah, Julia, I think we are on the asset yield we are slightly above 4%. Now in terms of reinvestment rate, I think I don't know, Gerald, uh, what you can say on that, but it's... Uh, we can, uh, yes, we, we can accept. To, we can we can expect to have a, a, a marginal investment, let's say between 3.5 and uh, 3.7. So it depends. You know that today we can have attractive rate. Uh, keep in mind that uh, uh, we don't. We have also we we, we have eight, more than 80 percent invested in fixed income. So it's roughly 50 percent in govies, 50 percent in, in corporate bonds. You can make your own mass. I gave you the duration. So assuming a duration between five and six, you can do your, your own calculation. And, and for the remaining, uh, it's more the capacity for us to, 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 uh, to, to realize some, some capital gains. Uh, uh, and uh, so uh, on, on, the, uh, on the remaining 30 percent, we can expect to have risk-free rate plus uh, one, 150 points, something around this. Very good. That's it. No regret. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you very much.